to and um, further ask ourselves these different questions as to how we can adapt, how we can cope, how we can become resilient and what instruments and models and that are available out there to help us cope. Because as Pamela said earlier on, as much as there's a crisis, the crisis also does bring opportunity for one to evolve and to adapt and to better, be better off in this dire situation. In light of that, our keynote speaker today is Mr. God Savior Christopher. He is from Tanzania. Uh, he's currently a PhD candidate at the University of Adja, I hope I'm, I'm, I've pronounced it correctly, in Norway. Uh, he's a researcher and a trainer by profession. He works with the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania and the Center for Banking and Financial Services, CBFS, and the Center for Research in Social Enterprises and Microfinance in Norway. He's, he's highly interested in financial literacy and inclusion. He believes in financial literacy is a powerful tool for, for financial inclusion. We'll be speaking, he will be speaking to us on the theme, the African youth breaking barriers in a hyperinflated economy. Over to you, Mr. God Savior. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Ms. Ruti Mukole uh, and Pamela Jikoore uh, and everyone uh, in the list. Uh, the protocol is observed. My name is God Savior. Maybe I can share a video because it's, I'm uh, participating in this. So my name is God Savior. Okay, I have some problem here. But my name is God Savior. I'm a PhD candidate uh, from uh, at University of Agda in Norway, but I'm also working with uh, University of Paris Business School. I'm at the Center for Banking and Financial Services Research, and also a research center for uh, microfinance in, uh, in Norway. So I'm um, so uh, grateful for being a keynote speaker in this particular uh, dialogue and I would like to share some insights and allow me to share my screen. Thank you. Allow me to share my screen. I prepared some, some PowerPoints for this. So. Okay, so we are going to discuss about the African youth breaking barriers in hyperinflated economy. So basically, I try to look at the global perspectives and then come down to Africa on what is really happening to, uh, to this particular continent. So if you look at the global population, uh, you can see that the annual growth rate of um, 1.2 for the past 10 years have been experienced. And as we talk now, uh, by 2020, the statistics that I have, uh, we had about 7.8 billion people on this planet. So this actually brings us down to see what is happening in Africa. So if you look at Africa, it is somehow interesting because the, the, the annual growth rate of this particular population is almost two times the global growth rate, which is 2.5. While if you look at the global, uh, the the global population growth rate is 1.2. So what does this tell us about Africa? Africa is one of the um, the population in Africa is growing at a very high rate as compared to the global growth rate uh, for the past 10 years and. Currently, by the, the statistic that I have is by 2020, we have about 1.35 billion people uh, who are living in Africa. So if we come down and look at the structure of the population that we have in Africa, we can see that 16.7% uh, of the total world population is coming from Africa, which is making a very large share compared to any other continent. So we have, uh, basically we are taking number two, 
uh, by the population size. And then looking at the population, we can see that 43.8% of the population is in urban area. So the remaining percent is in the rural area where they have uh, uh, infrastructure problem. They don't have electricity sometimes. They have uh, poor financial uh, inclusivity and some other many, many barriers. And looking at the age of this particular continent, we can see that the median age in Africa is 19.7 years. That means more than 50% of the population are youth. So we are talking about young people making uh, more than 50% of the total population in Africa. Then I have to, uh, to come down and look at what is happening. So with more than 60% of its population, uh, they are under the age of 25. Then specifically looking at the Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, it is the uh, world youngest region by now. So the youngest, uh, the large percent of the young people are living in Sub-Saharan Africa. And it is expected that by 2030, the Sub-Saharan Africa will be a home of more than one quarter. That means more than 33% of the world's under 25 years old population. So that means we have a very huge um, percent of youth who are going to be in Africa by the year 2020, which is just seven years from today. So what does this tell us? So coming back to the issue of inflation, why are we interested with looking at the inflation? It is because the inflation affects the economy and it is one of the macroeconomic variable which is going to influence another, a lot of microeconomic uh, factors at individual level, household, and the government uh, at large. So we have 53, uh, 53 economies in Africa, and looking at the data that are available uh, from the World Bank, you can see that only uh, two economies, that is Sudan and Zimbabwe, they are, they are having a triple digit inflation, that is more than 100%. So I guess Sudan is having one or three, while Zimbabwe is having something like two to five percent. That is the uh, increase in price. Then the 22 countries are having double digits. That means uh, 10 plus. And the remaining 29 uh, economies having single digits with an average of 6.1%. So, uh, uh, the lowest inflation, even in the world, is coming from uh, South Sudan, which is having a negative inflation rate, which is much better for the economy. Uh, and this data, these figures are coming from 2021 to 2022 period. So what does this tell us? So if you look at uh, the blue chart, so I have the blue chart here, which gives us the, uh, the the, uh, the double, digit, uh, double digit, sorry, the single digit inflation rate, you can see the list of countries and the inflation rate for the period of 2021, 2022. And we have the South Sudan, which is having the negative inflation rate here. Then we have another group of countries which are having a double digit, that means 10 and above. And surprisingly, Ghana is now taking the, the, the lead. That means it is having uh, more than uh, 30, it is around 40% inflation rate uh, in the country, in the continent. Then we have these two economies which are experiencing a three digit uh, inflation, which is Sudan, which is having one or three percent, and Zimbabwe. I guess everybody knows about what happened in Zimbabwe and the, the effect of this particular high inflation, the hyperinflation rate in the economy, which led them to uh, dollarize the uh, economy. That means they are now using uh, USD as the uh, currency. So this is the, 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 the general picture that we have from, uh, from Africa. So we have economies where majority of the population is youth, but also we see that we have economies which are um, experiencing a very high inflation rate, which is affecting the performance of the economy. 
So basically we can see in the past uh, uh, one year, like in 2022, this inflation rate is highly influenced by the, the imported inflation. We have something we call imported inflation. Samuel is back. Okay, so we we have an imported inflation because of the price of goods and services that we import from out uh, outside of Africa. The price is been very high, especially for the uh, oil importing countries such as Tanzania and other uh, nationals. Uh, but also we have the the wheat and um, uh, other products that are coming from Ukraine and uh, uh, Russia. It is causing most of this country to experience, especially this double digit economy. So this is really affecting the economy of Africa and the most affected people are the youth who make the largest percent of the, uh, the population in this two country, uh, in this uh, continent. Okay, so, okay, so, why are we now concerned with inflation? It is because the inflation is of major concern because it affects the, uh, the, 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 the purchasing power of individuals. Because while we have experienced shocks in the economy, uh, individuals still continue to earn fixed income. So their purchasing power is declining with time due to increasing price levels of uh, goods and services in the uh, economies. But also the other thing is, People are making investment because they expect that they are going to earn some returns on this particular investment. But now as inflation rate is going up and it is affecting the economy, then the returns that we get from investment are becoming less and less valuable as money loses its value because of the purchasing power. So inflation is affecting both uh, the, the income earners as well as investors who are earning returns on the uh, investment. So now, based on the, uh, the situation that we have in Africa, so I have uh, tried to highlight some uh, barriers that are facing youth uh, in these economies. And we have some facts. So if you can see from most of these countries, I have tried to do my, uh, my best in looking at what is happening in many of these countries. You can see that the number of youth that are graduating from university is increasing, not only in Africa, but globally. But now the formal sector of these economies cannot create sufficient opportunities to employ all these graduates given the current situation. So if we don't find a way to expand you know, the formal sector that receives most of these graduates from the universities, uh, we are experiencing a very high rate of unemployment in these high inflated economies. And with technological advancement, we can see some careers are being replaced with artificial intelligence. Things like banking sector, the insurance sector, people are moving in uh, with technology and human beings are being replaced. So the career, those who have uh, taken their career in banking and other uh, sector which can easily be uh, occupied or replaced by the artificial intelligence, they are also at risk of losing the uh, employment. So basically we have a problem. So then unemployment rate is very high in these African countries and most of the, uh, uh, of the politicians and practitioners, they are uh, arguing that the youth must focus on being self-employed, creating uh, employment instead of waiting for the employment opportunities from the, uh, from the formal sector. But now what is happening with, uh, uh, with the claim that politicians are coming with? So is self-employment feasible solution for, for, the, um, for this particular problem that we have in Africa? So does, uh, the question is, does our education system support uh, youth to have uh, their own uh, employment, like to, to be self-employed? So speaking of what Gloria uh, from Tanzania was, has highlighted and uh, the other uh, 
key key points that we got from the opportunities uh, that arises in the economy. We can see that the education system in most of African countries are not preparing youth to to be in a position to to employ themselves to engage themselves in uh, uh, in the in creating some institution in creating some small and medium enterprises which can create some employment opportunities in the in these economies. So there is a problem with education system, and Gloria has addressed this very well. And I guess we put some uh, in-text from, from our presentation. But another thing is our institutions, we have banks, we have financial institutions and other uh, legal uh, structures. Are these institutions supporting the self-employment of youth, especially in these high inflation, inflated economies? So we have problems of uh, claiming that youth should start their own businesses, run their business uh, fresh from uh, universities. But the problem is now when you approach the financial institution, they require that you must have some experience before getting a loan or be before accessing the capital that you need to start this particular uh, small and medium enterprises. So we still have a, a legal and uh, institutional problem within our countries, which really limits our, uh, our generation, the, the, the population from, uh, from solving the, the greatest problem that we are facing uh, in this particular continent. The other thing that we have is the background now. So you find that we are not sticking to the background that we have. Um, uh, our fam family and society supporting uh, our, our new uh, enterprises that we are going to generate. You find that someone is newly coming to the market. They don't have any background in running and operating these, these businesses. And uh, now the education system is not also preparing the youth for running their own businesses. So here we have the problem that Gloria has uh, also spoken on uh, on this because we need to uh, to come up with education that change the mindset of the youth instead of just having the curriculum that are not supporting the uh, the self employment because if you focus on the future we can see that uh, the population is growing at a very high uh, rate and now the formal sector is not expanding at the same rate so we have a problem. The, the number of graduates are expanding, but the uh, job opportunities, the employment opportunities that are available in our economies are somehow constant or changing at a very uh, slow rate. So we, we, we really need to, uh, to think of way forward breaking the, uh, the barriers that we are facing. So among other things, uh, if uh, we have to do some kind of uh, uh, initiatives, we have to support the youth-led non-government organization and volunteering, especially in, in, in helping this youth uh, being equipped with the right knowledge and skills that will help them to start and run their own um, businesses. But, but also we have uh, to include youth uh, in making some decisions because this was also discussed by Anastas uh, from Rwanda, the inclusivity and diversity. So youth councils, where youth um, come together and have their common voice in dictating what they are facing and uh, telling the, the government and whoever is responsible, what are they going through and the solution that they think they will be feasible is very important. But Another thing, based on uh, the education system that we have, we, we really need to have the life uh, skills training. And this can be basically through the youth led and government organization, which can volunteer uh, in providing this particular training. But skills development in secondary and tertiary education is very important, as Gloria has uh, presented. We need to change the way we teach our, our children. We need to change the way we treat our youth while in secondary and tertiary education. There is a need to change because uh, we have seen that there is a problem that is coming up very 
very fast and we need to take action on this. But we argue for the uh, for the formal sector as well as the private and public sector to provide some internship that will help you gain some experience before going to the uh, to start their own venture and uh, so forth. But when it comes to um, access to financial services now, we say youth are limited in terms of accessing capital from financial institutions because of lack of experience, especially running these small and medium enterprises. So we can think of uh, arguing for the special window for youth in financial institution where they can organize themselves in groups and have access to financial services uh, where the financial institution are having some special uh, window like giving them the grace period and whatever in order to support the year, the year startups. But now we also have to think of what is happening in the in technology. We are in the fourth industrial revolution and the technology is taking uh, a pace, replacing a lot of careers. So we have also to think about youth concentrating on taking the technological advantages. Things like knowledge in computer programming will be of great deal in the future and we will need to look at this when we are focusing on education. But investment in coding coming up with different uh, mobile apps and applications which can help to solve the to the problems that we are facing will also help us a lot in breaking a lot of barriers that we are currently facing. But there is another use of internet Okay, I guess the access to internet um, is now um, at a very good stage, especially in African countries compared to the past. And we have to argue that youth, youth need to use um, internet uh, to access financial services. Example, we have what we call the crowdfunding, where people come and uh, mobilize resources in order to start up and finance the system perhaps. And also they have several ways of accessing financial markets where they can have access to money. So the use of internet is also very important as it is helping us to break a lot of barriers that we are facing. But another thing that we need to consider is the digital financial inclusion. Youth need to, to have access to financial services, the various uh, financial services that they have to access. Because this, uh, we say financial services, uh, Financial inclusion is a, is a way or it is a channel through which we can achieve a lot of the sustainable development goals that are outlined by the United Nations. So this will enhance them to have savings, which can be later on used to use for start financing the startups. But also they will have protection against risk, the insurance service, especially for, for the startups because they are very high risk businesses. But there is another digital inclusion through investment. So we have things like blockchain and cryptocurrencies that are coming up in African continent. We don't have to lie and lag behind uh, when uh, taking these particular opportunities that are arising in the, uh, in the world. But also we have um, uh, digital and financial inclusion helping you to access financial markets. So raising funds, selling equity, and especially for these startups, some business angels can be interested uh, with the business ideas. I have heard about the Silicon uh, whatever in Kenya. And most of these uh, ideas are very interesting and they are very innovative. So we can have um, access to financial markets where we can get some, uh, some equity finance, some uh, debt finance, where we can uh, uh, finance our investment and make these ideas come into existence. So uh, I just conclude by saying financial inclusions for better tomorrow, and thank you very much for listening. And that is what I prepared for today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, God Savior. Just a question from my side is, um, 
how do we start looking at um, inclusion of, of persons with disabilities? Because um, I feel like most of the times when conversations are made, they often really um, don't, you know, talk much to them as much as there are so many platforms for us to, you know, adopt to or evolve into. Um, do, have we considered maybe the barriers that, you know, they might encounter? Um, if so, uh, how can we look into that? Okay, thanks for the question. I guess the uh, people with disability, especially, um, uh, I can, uh, they, they are access to financial services. We have several ways where we can include them in the financial system. Take like an example of uh, people who have uh, uh, physical disability, they cannot work to find it in the institution. Nowadays, we have the digital inclusion, which it is really helping us to access the uh, financial have access to financial services from wherever we are. So it is very few times nowadays we go to these financial institution banks or insurance companies or uh, the pension funds and uh, follow up and anything. We do everything online. So the technology is also playing an important role in ensuring that even people with disability are having access to financial services. So we think we have to think of a way of coming up with uh, digital inclusion, where you know, we can also consider the disability group. Yes, so specifically looking also at um, cognitive disabilities, because online um, inclusion generally means that you know everyone will have access to online services, but doesn't really take into uh, account people who have challenges with you know maneuvering. Um, um, social digital platforms, um, and so if someone has cognitive issues, how 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 do they become in, included? Okay, so now that that is another issue. So we 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 really need to make sure that we provide financial literacy to these groups, because uh, the access is one thing, but now once we have a supply of these digital services. The issue is people using it. And the problem is people are not using these digital services because uh, they don't know how to utilize the digital platforms that are provided by financial institutions. So basically, the important thing is financial inclusion, which Gloria has also spoken about. We have to think of including financial, um, financial literacy programs in the lower level education. Uh, especially in African countries, because we are lagging behind in terms of financial inclusion when we look at all the indicators that we use to measure financial inclusion. So financial literacy can help us. Okay, thank you. Okay, you can go ahead, Pamela. Okay, no, finally, did you have?